guess who's back? <laughs> Outside of studying, ignoring my channel, watching Eric do a lock in on Twitch and grinding Fortnite, of course, can't forget that, I've been testing Apple Intelligence and putting it through its paces since the 18.1 beta dropped at the end of July. And while we're still missing a lot of its functionality, I can tell this is going to be absolutely incredible. But right now, I mean, it's all right. But getting Apple Intelligence is relatively easy, provided you're not in the European Union or in China. But if you're in the EU, you get sideloading, so that's a it's not bad either. While the features are technically available outside of the US, you do need to set your phone language and Siri language to US English. You used to also have to set your region to the US as well, which did break a few formatting things and uh, you got like Apple Pay cash even if you were outside of the US, but you couldn't even use it. But uh, ever since beta 3 of 18.1, which dropped literally yesterday, you don't need to do all of that. If you're already in the US like most of you are, you don't need to do anything special here. I've got like a whole paragraph about like, how the US region impacted my use as an Australian, but that's useless. As of right now, there is a waitlist for Apple Intelligence. I updated my phone and attempted to join the waitlist on cellular data, but I didn't receive access until after I connected my phone to Wi-Fi, in which case I immediately got access and it started downloading all the models and everything started working from there. That was literally the morning at launch. So I don't know if you'll just be straight through the waitlist if you're on the developer beta or whether there will actually be a waitlist when 18.1 launches to the public, but that was my experience when I first joined. Once one of the devices linked to your Apple ID gets access and gets through the waitlist, that is your Apple ID getting through, not just your device. So I got access on my phone and didn't need to go through the waitlist on my Mac and my iPad. There was one point where upon restarting my Mac, I was pushed back into the waitlist, but then just restarting my system solved the issue again. So I'm not sure what happened there. During my setup process, there were a few points where it was a little bit scuffed. I had to restart my phone a couple times to get everything working correctly, particularly the double tap to Siri just didn't work until I restarted, but everything worked pretty well after that. And the features that I here get much better over time as they learn from you. The best feature and the one you'll easily notice first is that brand new Siri UI and UA uh, that just has that absolutely beautiful gradient animation that we all tried to basically jailbreak our phone to get in iOS 18 beta 1. As of right now in 18.1 beta 3 there aren't many huge new features that like have been announced in the keynote. However actions like having knowledge of how to do things on iPhone and also being able to stutter in a Siri request are available. What's the weather like in Siri? Uh, sorry I mean Canberra. How do I turn on dark mode? Uh, sorry, how do I schedule a message? Double tapping the home bar to open Siri is, as I mentioned, also here, and it is a really nice experience. The keyboard just looks phenomenal on iPad OS too. You can use this to do essentially anything you do within Siri just using a keyboard. So, you know, let me just ask it if there's rain. Uh, oh, but seriously, most things other than that work pretty nicely. The main growing pains here are just taking the requests that you would expect to do over voice and translating them into text. There is a bit of a head start on this because typing to Siri has existed for a very long time as an accessibility option, but now it's just being made more public facing. I mean, they're basically throwing Siri into the environment that it was supposed to avoid having to be involved with, so that is a little bit of a hurdle to get over. On macOS, the new design isn't as full, so like I wish the gradient just came and took over the full screen, but it doesn't. It stays up in the top right corner like Siri always has. And there is a bit of a new user experience, you can now double tap command or use a few other keyboard shortcuts to type to Siri, which is really nice alongside Spotlight or Raycast, you know, Raycast for searching for an app and then double tap command to ask something. It's really nice. Outside of that, it doesn't seem to have anything that isn't already on iOS and iPadOS. The main actual AI features that are available in the first few Apple intelligence betas are mainly the ones that surround large language models and text, with one of those being the writing tools. These are your textbook AI LLM features. Summarize a text, retone it, proofread it, all in a single tap. For the most part, these work pretty well. On iOS, they work in basically every app, seeing as they all mostly use the iOS native text editor. But the macOS apps that I use on a pretty common basis don't have support for them yet. So I'm assuming that would be an API. They might need to switch over to Apple's native text editor but that will take a bit longer than the iOS apps to get support. Currently, the only apps that I've tested to work that I actually use are text edit, pages, and the Raycast floating notes extension. And of course, you know, Apple Notes, basically every Apple app. They all integrate them really nicely. There's a little floating window that comes up whenever you click on the writing tools after highlighting a selection of text, and you can use it the exact same way you do on iOS. I've pretty much just found myself opening a new text edit window every time I need to like use them in a third party app and that is a decent workaround. I personally tested Craft and Obsidian with those writing tools and neither of those worked. 
I would assume things like Google Docs and Microsoft Word also don't have access to them. The results coming out of writing tools mostly were pretty great. There was one point where in the preparation for my HRC trials, making notes in Obsidian and trying to make them more concise, it completely missed a pretty crucial piece of information, but that's the only time I ever really noted something down or can recall that it missed a piece of information. In my experience, using writing tools never actually hallucinated more information, it just kind of missed out that one time. So I guess adding don't hallucinate to the system prompt works pretty well. Google, please take notes. Smart replies is one of the funniest and honestly smartest, but also somewhat useless thing that I've come across in my personal workflow. It is genuinely really cool to see a fully context aware sentence just form in like less than a second, right in front of my eyes on top of my keyboard this, as soon as I get a message. But I need Apple to understand that I do not use commas and exclamation marks as much as it thinks I do. If I was a more formal messenger, maybe if I like, I don't know, I was not Gen Z, they'd probably work pretty well and be decently indistinguishable from my writing style. Currently that default tuning is very obvious to the people that I talk to that what I am writing is not my writing, but it is AI generated. I have a lot of faith that they will get better at matching my exact writing style. And if they do actively do that, one of the biggest things that I've noticed is that it matches your style across different text threads. It doesn't just learn from you as a whole. It genuinely looks at every message in a thread and makes it off of that. If I open a text from one of my friends with a smart reply, the suggested reply will be in all lowercase. Meanwhile, if I open one from my parents, it will have capitals at the start of a sentence because that's how I text between those two types of people. So the fact that it can do that now in its first betas gives me a lot of hope for the future. In messages, it's, for what it is, pretty bare bones. Just one or two suggested messages that when you tap them, just get inserted straight into the text field. In mail though, certain replies can bring up prompts to fill in information and generate a fully featured, much more fleshed out response. I'm not a huge email person outside of YouTube. It's just not something that I use a lot. And in those scenarios, I do find that the smart replies generated don't really fit the conversation tone or that I need more information, but it is a great starting point. I've had a few emails with an individual surrounding a few media opportunities and the smart replies there worked pretty well. Asking questions for my answers in responses to the questions asked in the email to give out a better response that actually has the information that the other contact needed. It even took the sender's preferred nickname out of their email signature as opposed to just using the fully legal name that's in my contact for them. The smart replies are definitely amazing at generating responses based on what they have at hand, but they need to be more human to actually serve as a replacement for typing, which maybe they're not supposed to, but that's how I kind of see it going in the future. I can also picture the context that smart replies have available becoming much better when the semantic indexing starts happening. Things like, you know, if you get a text, oh, are you free at this time? And then it looks at your calendar and it's like, oh no, I'm not free. I've got this on. One thing to note here is that while it might seem a bit obvious, whenever you use a suggestion and then hit the thumbs up or down, it will send a portion of that whole message to Apple for feedback and training. That might seem obvious, but that, you know, these are the files that show up when you use it for messages, for example. So that's just something you'll want to keep in mind. Don't just habitually click thumbs up and submit if you're messing with confidential information here. It doesn't send any actual contact names or info there and you can view exactly what it sends in the feedback sheet before it sends. Easily the feature that I've used the most with Apple Intelligence over the last month is the summaries of long text, particularly emails. In Apple's apps, the summaries are available pretty abundantly. For emails, every email you get sent with the beta on is automatically summarized and that replaces the subject line in your notifications and you can get a more detailed summary inside your inbox at the click of a button. Existing emails don't get summarized automatically for the subject line, but you can of course just hit the button and generate one if you need it. My messages also get summaries of long messages and threads and a bunch of smaller messages within group chats and in one-on-one -on -one conversations. That was the extent before beta three uh, dropped literally yesterday. Now any third party app can have their notifications summarized if there's a bunch of them, or I'd assume if there's one really long one as well, but I haven't gotten long notifications, so I haven't been able to attest to that. Outside of communication apps, most articles within Safari in like reader mode can be summarized as well. Those are the features that I've personally found the most use out of. I believe that longer voice memos can be transcribed and summarized, including call recordings, which were added in 18.1, but I tried to use it once, it said it was recording and then just didn't save the recording, so now we're here. It did tell the other person I was recording and it said it was recording and then it just didn't save, but whatever. One of the more general quality of life features that were introduced by Apple Intelligence is the reduce interruptions focus. At first, I didn't even realize it was in the first beta because you do have to manually go into the focus settings and add it there. But once it's on, it works pretty nicely and does a pretty decent job at funneling out unimportant notifications and making sure the important things actually get to you. This only worked on first party apps for the first day that I had it, making sure the messages and emails got through to me. But as I progressed, 
less and use my phone more with the beta. Third party apps like Waterminder and the app I used for my shifts started breaking through that notification filter as well. Outside of writing tools, that's kind of the main area right now where third party apps take advantage of Apple intelligence. It can fail sometimes. Notifications that I would consider important, like this rejection email from Apple Retail, which also automatically got summarized, they did not break through my reduce interruptions focus. And notifications telling me to stay hydrated where marks is important, I can kind of get that maybe people would want that as important, but I think that's more of a thing where you would just allow that app all the time if you needed it. The last set of features that I've mainly been taking advantage of are the new AI indexing things in the Photos app. This is the closest thing we currently have to all of the actual like really cool semantic indexing stuff and it's in photos, it's actually pretty useful. The new indexing took probably around 12 hours to get through my photo library of, I think it was around 8,000 images at the time. And I had the feature working at around midnight the day after I installed the beta. And it works shockingly well. Complex searches like people wearing VR headsets, wearing a blazer, mum with cats in Sydney, and Harry in a yellow shirt all worked nearly flawlessly. Even more complex terms like wearing a hat with Harry while he's wearing glasses, did bring up some relevant results, although some of the other results further down weren't as accurate to that search term. Would like to quickly point out these searches don't seem to be working as well as they usually did. Uh, I could have something to do with the fact that I just dropped 6,000 images from my Google Photos into my iCloud Photos, so. The only way I was really able to get it to fall short was with hyper-specific queries, like handheld game console at 25% battery life. That did not work, despite the fact that I do have a video of my Steam Deck, a handheld gaming console, at 25% battery. Outside of those features, I'll get to the, I'll get to beta three in a bit. Just give me a sec. Outside of those features, there isn't really much else with imaging. The image generation features like Genmoji and the image playground are completely non-present at the time of writing and recording. With the only remnants of these I've seen are the create new emoji button that shows up for a split second every now and then when I search for an emoji, it just teases me. It wants me to make emojis and I can't. I have no AI generator and I must make emoji. <laughs> the app that also kind of used to be accessible on Mac OS, but was hidden, the image playground app is also completely gone now. And of course, you know, as as soon as I finalize the script, we get 18.1 beta 3 with a ton of new features. Again, like I talked about this earlier, the main new thing that we get is notification summaries for any app, and that has worked pretty well. In fact, I can pull one up right now. There's Twitch, summarizing my streamer notifications. Now the big new feature outside of summarization is the cleanup feature in Apple Photos. So now, just like Google Photos and the Magic Eraser, you can erase objects, people, whatever, from your photos entirely on device, which is really cool. And what's also really cool is that if you circle a face, it doesn't actually try to remove it, it just adds a mosaic blur unless you do the whole person, which is a really nice touch as opposed to it just trying to remove a head and then you've got a bunch of decapitated bodies that are somehow alive and not zombies in the back of your photo, which is really cool. I can also confirm that like the nine to five Mac report, setting your phone region to whatever country and then just making sure the language is US English and the Siri language is US English works flawlessly. I've still got all of the Apple intelligence features and my phone region is Australian. So that is really cool. Now, one thing that I've just remembered, I forgot to write in the script, but I do need to talk about are the lack of features like the image generation. None of the semantic indexing things are here. Siri is still mostly just Siri. There's a lot here that's missing and a lot that probably won't come out until 18.1 publicly launches in October and potentially even going into next year, I would guess that we're still going to be missing a lot of features. That is one thing you'll probably want to consider. Not everything is here yet, but what is here is really promising and gives me a lot of hope for the future of this tech. The fact that these features are the ones they include in the very first betas are again, really promising for the next era of Siri and AI at Apple. The fact that they've started saying AI in their keynotes is a great step forward to them actually adopting the technology. Not that they haven't, there's so much machine learning happens here, but like generative AI. Right now, the features that are here aren't huge driving factors. I would not tell you to go out and buy an iPhone 15 Pro or an M1 Mac and iPad just for these features. Like seriously, do not go and buy a new phone for Apple intelligence in its current state. At least wait for the iPhone 16. But if you have a 15 Pro and if you're outside of the US, you don't mind setting your language to US English, these are some really cool features. Most of these features have been genuinely helpful to me in my day-to-day -day life. I used Apple intelligence to fix up some words in my industry tech portfolio before I submitted it off this, uh, a couple weeks ago. And it's been really saving my time from email subjects that are terrible and don't actually say anything. So there's my thoughts. I hope you guys enjoyed that video and I hope you guys enjoyed that I am back. I'll probably, look, realistically, I'm probably gonna be taking another break for the actual HSC because I'm not out of the water yet and it's a busy few months ahead of me, but 
I'll do my best. If you guys are looking for more content, you can follow me on Instagram, threads, and everything else are the links on screen and in the description below. And hey, while you're there, you may as well, you know, like, subscribe, notifications on, so you never miss a video. And hey, you can, it's free, you can always undo it, so you may as well. Also, not sure if you guys noticed, I got a new camera. I'm in 4K now. And if you did notice, I hope it wasn't, oh, why'd he change cameras? Guys, it's got USB-C. I don't need a camera charger. It just has USB-C. I got my IKEA cable plugged into this and it's in my table. Whoa! If you want more videos, you can click over here to check out my coverage of the Vision Pro launch in Sydney, or you can check out this video where FlexiSpot sent me that desk to make a video on it. It's a really good desk and you should go watch the video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Woo!